Hey everyone, this is Allie Sorley, Education Outreach Coordinator at the Alabama Museum of Natural History. I want to welcome you to another segment of Bama Bug Fest on the web. Today we are going to go bugging, which is one of my favorite activities ever. And today I'm joined by Todd Hester, environmental educator and former naturalist at the museum and also just lover of water bugs. Um, I think so Todd's gonna help us look for some aquatic macroinvertebrates today in this beautiful stream. Are you excited about it, Todd? I'm super excited. Do you love water bugs? I love water bugs. What'd you find, Todd? So this is a Dobson fly larva, or Helgramite. And these guys can live up underwater. Uh, when they're an adult, they come to the surface, they hatch, uh, and they fly away. And they're really strange looking creatures. If you look up uh, Dobson fly on the internet, you'll see pictures of the adult Dobson flies. They look really different from their larval form, which is what we're seeing right here. So these guys have really powerful jaws. I don't want to get too close to them, and he's spreading them open right there. Um, and they're predators, and so they prey on other bugs uh, that are in the water. Uh, so they'll eat stonefly larva, mayfly larva, um, you know, anything that they can grab a hold of, they'll eat um, in the water. Uh, so these are really important indicator uh, insects. Um, these guys are what we call class two, or they're in the tier two level of pollution sensitivity. And so you have three different tiers, one being the most sensitive to pollution, two can tolerate a little bit, uh, and three can pretty much tolerate any kind of water. So these guys are right there at the, the, the cusp of one and two, so they're pretty si sensitive to pollution. And since this guy is so honking big, uh, we know that he's had a healthy uh, ecosystem here in this creek for a while. Um, these species, you know, they live underwater. In the case of some, like dragonfly larvae, cer certain species of dragonfly larvae can live up to seven years in the water uh, as larvae. So if you're finding these critters, then you know that the water quality has been good for, you know, a longer period of time than you would just doing chemical testing. And so these guys are really important species. So Todd, I know you're looking for aquatic macroinvertebrates. Could you help us um, understand what that term means? Yeah, so if we break down the terms, uh, aquatic obviously means water. Invertebrate means an animal that doesn't have a backbone, so we're talking about insects. And then macro, uh, as opposed to micro, meaning it's large enough for us to see with our naked eye. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for bugs, that are large enough for us to see with our eye that live underwater, basically. Uh, that's what an aquatic macroinvertebrate is. And the reason why they're so important, um, because we use them to determine water quality over extended periods of time. Uh, most people are familiar with water chemical testing, um, where you can go out, you can take water samples, and you can mix chemicals, and they change color, and they tell you a lot of information about dissolved oxygen, their pH, and things like that. And those are wonderful tools and wonderful um, uh, tests that we do in, in, uh, in a watershed to determine the health. But those shouldn't be used on their own. You should do an ecosystem study to determine the bug, the, the water bug health, the fish health, the mussel health. Um, all of those factors need to play in to tell us really the, the health of the water quality in a given area. <laughs> That's great. And when you're looking for them, you are looking under rocks, it looks like? I am. So I'll pick up a rock, and I'll kind of let the water drain off. Um, some of these things are really small, so 
you let the water drain off and they'll start squirming a little bit and then you can see them. Um, not all of them are the size of our big Helgramite that we found. So when you're looking, are you looking for things that are moving around and just and shapes that just don't look like a rock? That's what I'm looking for, yeah. Things okay. that move around, um, you'll know it when you see it kind of thing. Okay. Um, everybody's picked up something and found a bug on it. Um, so you kind of know what you're, what you're looking at, what you're looking for. Some of them can be really hard. Some of these rocks have, you know, algae and... Uh, moss growing on them, so it's kind of hard to see. Todd, did you find something else? I did. Uh, I turned over this rock and we're finding some little stone flies. They're hard to see, but you can kind of see them squiggling around a little bit. There's one right there. Yeah. And the stone flies are really important. They're one of the smaller uh, species. There's a couple of them over here. And these are what those Helgramites will, will feed on. So they'll go underneath these rocks and they'll They'll prey on these little stoneflies and other guys. Uh, stoneflies are in that tier one category. I was going to put this guy back. Uh, always try to put the rocks back how you found them. As close to how you found them as possible. Because that's their home, that's their habitat, and that's where we want to keep them. So tell me more about those stoneflies. So stoneflies, like I said, they're in that tier one category of uh, aquatic uh, insects. And so they are really sensitive to pollution. Uh, so if we're finding stoneflies, we're finding helgramites in here, or, or the dobson fly larva, the water quality here uh, has been good for uh, an extended period of time. Um, if there was a pollution event that came through, there would be no stoneflies here. So it's a really important find to find those stoneflies here. And I see that we are looking for these insects in flowing water. Is that is there a reason for that? Yeah, so the, the species that we're really looking for, they depend on a high dissolved oxygen content in the water. And that's what you get when you have flowing water like we have here in this creek. Um, obviously, you can see the falls. Um, and then along the way, you have flowing ripples of water um, that turns over and it gets a lot of oxygen mixed in with the water and that's what these creatures need. Now you can find aquatic macroinvertebrates in any kind of water. You can find them in lakes, you can find them in ponds, oh. <coughs> excuse me. But here is where you find the greatest diversity of aquatic macroinvertebrates and that's why we're, we love to find them in, in creeks and streams like this right here. So Todd, if, if people want to look for these, oh wow, what are those? Big, big stone fly right there. And you see a smaller one right here. Look at all of them. So if people wanted to do this and find these, is this something that they could do themselves? Absolutely. Uh, if you know of a local stream 
Um, as long as you have, if it's a private area, as long as you have permission from the landowner, or if it's a public recreation area like, like this one is, you're more than welcome to go out. Um, the technique that we did is probably the best one. Um, so when you find stuff, I highly encourage everybody to download the iNaturalist app. Um, you can take photos of it, you can send it off, and people can identify it uh, if you can't identify it. And it gives us a catalog of where all these things are. And so it helps us improve the biodiversity uh, surveys of our state and our city, Tuscaloosa here. Excellent. Um, I think that should do it for today. I want to say thank you for having us or coming out with us and going bugging with us. Thanks for inviting me. Anytime to go bugging. I love to bug out. <laughs> bug out's great. All right, well, this is again has been Todd Hester, environmental educator. Thank you so much for being here and spending some time and expertise with us. Awesome, man. Bug on. All right, say, hi, my name is Todd. Hi, my name is Todd. I'm a naturalist.